So what are you looking for? Well, I'm looking for conceptually correct ways to catch big moves. For instance, a buy at B in the IPOs. Conceptually correct just means that there's some sort of basis for why you are trading a certain way. So if, it, if you're trend trading, then you know that there is demand for the market and you have some sort of setup to get you in, maybe after correction, such as a pullback, when that trend begins to resume. So the idea is that you're going to become part of that demand, and hopefully that demand continues to come in to the market. So, for, and you're along for the ride. That's just trend following. And for a conceptually way to correct, to catch a move in IPOs, I was thinking, well, an IPO is a brand new stock. If it starts making new highs then maybe it's in pretty good shape because let's say it's going to a hundred well it's going to have to pass through 10 first if 10 is a brand new high and then i started studying the closing highs because that's something i learned many years ago sometimes a closing high can be kind of stealthy and be hidden below the real highs and you can get a big move out of that also look for maybe ways to stay out of trouble it's like once again you're kind of looking at the the flip side of things and that's how i came up with the tfn 10 percent system if a market's going to drop 50 percent in value it's going to drop 10 percent first okay now 10 percent might be too big of a too small of a number i should say for a very volatile stock and that's where you kind of need to eyeball it and maybe look at the historical volatility or hv as i call it to see if see how volatile stock is now, as I'm doing research, empirical research especially, my thinking, for instance, with like the intraday trading is, let's say I'm looking at SoxL, and SoxL has this huge wide range bar. Well, that, that wide range bar will start with a narrow range bar that gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And especially something like the S&P 500, although it works on all ETFs. But for the S&P 500, I'm very cognizant of, unless it's like an opening gap reversal situation or something, I'm very cognizant to let the market open and establish a range first to see how big that range is going to be. And ideally, I want to trade ranges that are 50% or more because those have the potential to go 100% or more for the day as far as the range expansion is concerned now if they're at 29 or 39 percent or whatever and all of a sudden it looks like they're making a really big move and it looks like i'm going to get to that 50 percent, then maybe i might get in a little early especially if it's an opening gap reversal again or something like that and as i alluded to a second ago something like the 10 percent line for indices is a good area to consider exiting a market to get out of trouble how do you collect data i've only seen a data file on the tfm 10 percent system do you have any other files you could share that show what data you collect for analysis how do you run your back testing so i talked about this last week let me just recap real quick just to make sure every part of the question is answered i back test by hand bar by bar i'll back up a chart yeah Something like the S&P 500, I'll go back to the 1900s and then click, 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 click. Is that a signal? Is that a signal? Is that a signal? Yes, yes, no, no. And just one day at a time. And you learn a lot in the process by doing that. You'll learn about Landry Light. You'll learn about how that 10% line interacts. And in the case of like the 10, TFM 10% system, I started off with just a 10% line. And then I realized that there were some whipsaw times where excessive whipsaw where it would drop below that 10% and pop right below, right right above, I'm sorry. And so what I decided to do is like, well, let me just figure out a simple whipsaw filter. And that's where the 50 simple moving average came in because sometimes that moving average will be a little bit below that 10% line and it'll violate the 10% line, but it won't violate the moving average. So that'll keep you in the market. And then on the upside, because I want to get out the market quickly, right? So a close below the 50 simple weekly and a close below the buy line gets me out of the market. But to get me back in, it has to close above the buy line and I need two bars greater than the 50 simple. That's the whole system right there. Okay, write that down. And that's just two bars of Landry Light to the upside. And I have plenty of videos on the TFM system out there 
Also, I think, I'm trying to think of a good link to give you. I'll put something in post maybe, but you can get a, uh, you can sign up on my website for a free membership and you'll get a free market timing course out of that, which has a TFM 10% system in it. And like I said last week, I'm not a mechanical, I'm not a mechanical trader, but in more recent years, I've incorporated some mechanical trading into my longer term analysis. So like I just said, I'm long the queues on a TFM 10% system. And I don't, I need to be careful because like, I don't want to get, start crazy day trading or whatever with my daughter's accounts but i figure it's safe to save quote unquote safe <laughs> but it's a, a little bit safer probably to just keep them in longer term because they are younger obviously and then use something like the tfm temper system to get them out of the market and i think it keeps you out the market about 30 percent of the time if memory serves and all that data was done by hand now, I used to do a shit ton of programming, as I've said before. How do you confirm the robustness of the results? Well, first thing is, is it accomplishing the designer's intent? Missing a 90% diaper change moment in something like the S&P 500 in the 30s, and then missing the, or avoiding the 1987 crash, getting out of the market right when the pandemic began to hit hard on the market, at least the market took it seriously. That's accomplishing my designer's intent. Intent. Now, can you actually trade it? That's, that's one thing you need to think about. There's some stuff out there that might work, but it would be very hard to follow. The biggest question you probably need to ask is, does it win big and lose small? And can you put a little money management on top of it to make sure it does that too? Does it avoid some, but obviously not all, whipsaw? If you start working really hard with a lot of whipsaw filters, sooner or later you're going to curve fit the past data perfectly. And I remember years ago I told someone who was a mechanical guy that his biggest drawdown was in front of him with the mechanical system, and he got very angry at me. And I would love to contact him today and ask him if I was right. But I don't want to be shot in Friday because I'm pretty sure I was right. Anyway, uh, as I've said quite often, statistics are worthless. 75.3% of all people know that. Feel free to play with the MFE and MAE and all the other good stuff. I think it's MFE is maximum favorable excursion and MAE is maximum adverse excursion. And I'm hoping I'm getting that right. I don't use that stuff anymore. Like I said last week, the problem with something like MFE is like, oh, you never really make more than than $2,000 with this system. So as soon as you get to $2,000, shut it down. Well, what happens if, first of all, you're capping your gains, and then what happens if the market really blows off, and then you might have a 1,000% gain, gain, okay? And then you, the other statistic is, well, what's the worst hit you take, and then it bounces back? There's some merit to that, but as a general statement, the statistics don't really do you any good because there's no guarantee that that's going to be the worst hit you ever take you know so you got to be careful now with statistics of course and the thing too to remember that markets don't adhere to statistics it's not norm they're not normally distributed they have fat tails and years ago i was talking with a cta back when i was a cta and he said, we're trading for that outlier. We're trading for that fat tail. And that's exactly what we're doing. Do you dissect the trade methodology idea against capitalization size, small, mid, large, and historic volatility thresholds, volume thresholds? If so, do you break stocks down into groups, small cap, large cap? Well, the quick answer to that is no, I do not. Now, as I'm kind of thinking about this, I, I have noticed things that might actually, for instance, the, the ogre is kind of just the opposite of what I look for, as I often say, in the in the the normal stocks, the, the average stocks I trade or the normal stocks I'm usually trading. So over the gap reversal, mm -hmm. you probably want like a a big cap stock. Like if the video would have gapped down today and then started recovering because it's in a pretty good trend. That might have been a, an excellent opening gap reversal type of trade, a big, fat, stick, thick stock. So, yes, as far as the observations 
or concern from all my empirical research, which is a fancy word from looking at charts, but no as far as in general. Now, I do tend to notice tendencies, for instance, like volatile, volatile stocks within reason offer your best chance of beating the market, okay? And I've done presentations before where I show how a volatile stock is actually less risky to trade than a less volatile stock as a general statement. And that's because a less volatile stock can't, something bad could still happen to that less volatile stock. Whereas the volatile stock, you sort of know the devil you're dealing with. And also you're going to be trading a much smaller share size. You're already compensating for that crazy nature of that stock. Now, as a general statement with the core methodology, smallish cap stocks tend to move better and more. But in more recent years, I have noticed some high volume speculative issues that could really take off. And this seemed to happen before the pandemic. And then it's like now you get these hot stocks that have millions and millions and millions of shares and they're trading with a high volatility, like something that would be like a crazy smaller cap stock. And, you know, I'm just thinking out loud here, you know, maybe that's some research to do. OK, maybe take a look at super volatile stocks that have crazy volume and and that might be something worth looking into. I know on an intraday basis, volatile stocks that have big ranges and have super high volume can make for some interesting trades. And I've gotten caught fortunately on the right side, but it, it doesn't seem to work as good as it used to. But I've gotten caught in a few trading halts on some of these guys. And you always in the old days a trading halt meant the stock was going to open up huge afterwards. And but nowadays it seems like they open down. So it's like it really the trading halt actually seems to work to uh, calm people down a little. But yeah, that's another tendency is that volatile, highly volatile stocks with a lot of volume can offer some opportunities here and there.